You are listening to The Emulsion Podcast, a show that informs and inspires the restaurant industry to work, live, and create better. My name is Justin Kana. I'm a chef and media producer with almost 10 years of experience in award-winning restaurants all over the world. I created this show as a way to give back, to inspire the next generation, and help you progress your career. The Emulsion Podcast is sponsored by you folks, and Patreon is where that happens. If you're here as a return listener and enjoy the episode you just came from and happen to want to support more episodes, visit patreon.com slash Justin Kana. I'd really appreciate it if you can. I totally understand if you can't. Free ways you can support this show include leaving a like or comment on this episode, filling up all five stars on iTunes so more people can find us, or simply sharing an episode with a friend. This is a solo episode. That's right, it's just you and me. I'll be dishing up a curated list of articles, happenings, and headlines that I've been paying attention to over the past few days, and then season them with my perspective and opinion on these industry stories. Let's get ready to welcome your host for this episode, Justin Kana. Okay, that's one minute. I think that's the show. What is up, folks? Justin Connor here. This is episode 74. We are live on Instagram today as per usual. I haven't 100% figured out how I'm going to do these solo episodes as far as like converting them into valuable IGTV content yet. This one is shot horizontally. I switched it from being vertical. I don't know about you folks, but I've kind of fallen off the IGTV wagon. I never really was on it in the first place. I guess like for myself, I was curious curious to see how it was going to turn out, but a really good judge for me is how much myself and my friends are actually consuming or talking about a certain thing as far as like, is it popular? It's cool to say that it's cool, like nice to produce content for IGTV, but it's another thing to be like, do you actually consume IGTV content? And frankly, I don't watch anything on IGTV, so I kind of have a hard time justifying creating content for it. I did like the fact that I switched it and then I could have a little, you know, something playing over on this side. That's what I'm going to do here, more or less like news broadcaster style. I, I want to know, are you chomping at the bit to have me create some standalone IGTV content, like individual stories from this show or deeper dives? Um, I want to know. So that, that, that being said, um, I, I, I ultimately want the show to be delivered to you in the least amount with the least amount of friction as possible. So I'm working on getting the show on Spotify. I just had a little chat this morning with the folks over at Simplecast as far as like customer support. I'm trying to get the show through that platform published everywhere so that you can actually get the show on Spotify. So I'm working on it. But yeah, that's that's the little update on kind of like the format changes. I'm testing. I'm always, always testing. So today we're going to talk a immense amount of food critic news from Chicago to L.A. to San Francisco, and there's a lot to talk about. So we're going to get into that. New York's best restaurants of 2018 so far, as well as the uh, 18 best new restaurants from Eater, changing how the Pacific Northwest eats. French laundry plating and a really fascinating non-industry story that talks about finding your own creative style. So leave your questions uh, and keep the conversation rolling in the comments wherever you're listening, especially on Instagram. But for now, here's a few headline updates in rapid fire fashion for your news needs. So Jose Garces's restaurant group has officially been sold for $8 million in cash. This is an update to the crazy financial problems and lawsuits that they were facing a few weeks ago. The purchase was made Made by 3BM1, Garces will remain involved as the group's quote unquote chief culinary officer. Parts Unknown fans, you can rejoice. There are still five episodes that still have yet to be released. In addition to the great news that they've gotten six Emmy nominations, the show will cover Kenya, the Tex-Mex border, uh, Indonesia, the lower east side of Manhattan, and Spain's Asturias region. Those are going to be coming up later uh, this year. Speaking of travel shows, Gordon Ramsay has one of his own. Now think of it like Beat Bobby Flay meets Anthony Bourdain, but with Gordon Ramsay as the host, which if you're thinking that sounds horrible, that would make two of us. He's going to try to, quote, outcook local chefs at their own cuisine, end quote. So stay tuned to see if that ends up being a entertaining in the good way or entertaining in the hot pile of garbage kind of way. We'll see how that plays out. If that wasn't enough uh, TV news, season Season 5 of Chef's Table will kick off on September 28th on Netflix. The four chefs have yet to be announced, but there is actually, 
we'll see. I mean, Chef's Table Pastry got a little bit of backlash. We're going to see who they choose and and who they announce as that goes forward. But meanwhile, there's also a pretty well-known cookbook called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat by Samin Nosrat, which will also be made into a four-part series on Netflix where she visits Japan, Mexico, Italy, and Chez Panisse to dive into those fundamental elements of good cooking. And that will actually premiere on October 19th, so just a month after Chef's Table gets premiered. Netflix is really doubling down on the food content. I love it. That's enough headlines. It's actually the first time I've ever done that rapid fire headline. Uh, so smash up the likes for the, for that rapid fire headline rundown. And if you want to see more uh, intros like that, definitely leave a comment down below. And I'd love to uh, start things off like that because with these shows being every two weeks, it's really hard to stay on top of all the news that's happening, uh, especially in the summer where everyone's making making money moves. So uh, yeah, that, that way I can cover a little bit more. Uh, and not do so much deep diving, but I will link up everything that I talk about in the show notes, whether you're listening on a podcast or if you're watching this as a YouTube video. Today's beverage, I'm rifling through, this is almost six month old coffee, but it's uh, not brewed six months ago. It's like it was roasted six months ago. And so I'm making it into cold brew. This is like a weird concoction of um, Hawaiian, Ethiopian, Kenyan, yeah, it's like a mutt mix of coffee that I made into cold brew because it was supposed to be, it, it, it was hot this week in Seattle, um, but I like to have that as my second cup as a go-to because if I don't have this, I'll go out and get an iced Americano and that quickly adds up. So that's today's beverage. First up, we got to talk about the industry shaking news that Jonathan Gold, LA's LA Times food critic since the 1980s, passed away at just 57 years old from pancreatic cancer. This is just a couple weeks ago. It's not new news. You've probably already read all the headlines and done your own research into this, so I'm not going to go too much into that. You've probably seen all the tweets and the Instagram posts, but I want to take a second and talk about him as a critic. One, for my own personal knowledge, I've actually never been to LA. I've briefly consumed his work as far as reading about new restaurants through his eyes, and I've seen like the Ugly Delicious episodes where he's in that, but I want to dive a little bit deeper myself, but I also want to share some of those big takeaways through my research of him and what we can learn from his perspective and his career as a whole. So I've linked up three separate articles that have come out. One is by Pete Wells. One is a piece that Eater did about like the uh, Jonathan Gold through his own words, where they basically gathered a bunch of his own quotes and made some given given some context to it. And then L.A. Times did a piece on him as well. So. Feel free to do a deep dive for yourself if you wish, but I'm going to start with a few quotes that uh, more or less encapsulate his legacy and why he is so dearly missed. Quote, unlike some critics, Mr. Gold never saw expensive, rarefied restaurants as the peak of the terrain that he surveyed. End quote. That's from Pete Wells. And Ruth Reichel says, quote, before Tony Bourdain, before reality TV and parts unknown and people really being into ethnic food in a serious way, it was Jonathan who, com who got it completely. He really got that food was a game way into the people and that the food could really define a community. He was really writing about the people more than the food, end quote. That is from Ruth Reichel, who is a great writer and editor in her own right. So talking about a life well lived, right? It estimates uh, people are saying in some of these articles that he would put 20,000 miles a year on his Dodge Ram pickup truck, just going from place to place. He would listen to opera as he was going from restaurant to restaurant. And he actually owned between three and 5,000 cookbooks. So if, if, we're, if we're talking about numbers and a, and a great life, that's, uh, that's pretty good. And another point that I personally didn't know that, which is, quote, the hallmark of his style, though, was the second person voice. He used it a lot, taking literally, he seemed to be saying that you personally had visited a great number of restaurants and consumed a wide variety of animal parts, end quote. And that was from Pete Wells. So he had this very distinct writing style of not saying I did these things, not saying that the restaurant did these things, but he would say, like, you are in this seat eating these chicken livers or, or, or what have you. And that was a very, very uh, unique to him. So I thought that was really interesting. Gold himself saying, quote, I think the worst thing you can do is write down to your readers, especially doing what I do, right? Everybody eats three meals a day. Everybody is an expert on something in food, even if it's just the way that they like their scrambled eggs done, end quote. And before I get into my opinion, here's one more quote from Gold, quote, the greatest tool in the toolbox is, as a critic of anything, your job is to basically, at least in a world of historical scale, know more about the restaurants you're going to than even the people doing it. You know why they're doing things. You know why they're doing things. 
just wanted to make sure I got that right, end quote. So the reason that he won, at least in my opinion, the reason he's going to be a legend for years to come is that he kind of transcended the sensationalist food writing. He came he came up without the internet, right? And he stayed in LA after the Michelin Guide left because he didn't care about the Michelin Guide. It's, it, it's a hard thing to wrap your head around these days. And it's weird for me to say this like and tout it as being this great thing, but he actually cared about what he did. He wasn't in it for the followers or the money or the recognition. He literally went anonymous for years. So that being said, that's not the point, right? The point is that he was a proponent in LA's kind of big urban sprawl to encourage exploration. And he says it himself that he wanted people to not be afraid of their neighbors. He cared so much about food and the stories behind that food that you know, a lot of LA chefs actually literally credit him with helping them find their own style to discover what their cuisine actually is. Because when you have someone like Jonathan Gold questioning why you're doing what you're doing with your food, there's nowhere to hide, right? Gold was better read and he was better traveled and he was better eaten than 99.9% of the population. So when it came to evaluating food, he knew how to connect those dots and how to kind of question why you're doing what you're doing. And that's why that's why I feel like his legacy is gonna gonna live on for 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 a long time. And I wanted I, I did want to spend a good portion on the beginning of this show and this story specifically for two reasons. One, a person as devoted and consistent and talented and empathetic as, in this industry as Jonathan Gold should be remembered in this light. He had way too many meals left to eat to leave so soon, but I wanted to highlight why I spent so much time two episodes ago ripping so hard on Ryan Sutton, uh, because it comes down to intent, right? One is attempting to share his stories and share the keys to his city and explore the culinary offerings all over the spectrum from fine dining to not so fine dining. And then another guy is chasing headlines and touting expensive price tags. So there's a difference, and I want to. I, I I didn't feel like I gave enough context in my piece on Ryan Sutton to show what the other side looks like. Um, but I want to end with a quote from Peter Meehan. Quote: He wasn't looking down his nose at the world. He was looking out from the table and trying to put restaurants, meals, and cuisines in context. Empathy, understanding, commensality. That's what he brought to the game. Jonathan didn't write restaurant reviews. He wrote about who we are and how we feed each other. He wasn't just a better writer than the rest of us. He cared more, too. End quote. So next up in I definitely didn't see it coming. Critic news. Again, we're staying on the critic bandwagon. Michael Bauer, a crazy influential critic for the San Francisco Chronicle, working currently in the area of the U.S. with the most three Michelin star restaurants, is stepping down from his position as the critic for that publication. So after 32 years, he'll be taking time to branch out in, quote, freelance writing, working on a book, and pursuing other interests, end quote. His last piece will run later this summer, and the Chronicle is on the national search for its newest restaurant critic. So very, very eager to see what happens there. But what's interesting and what sticks out to me with this story is how he navigated his entire career. Uh, he has a lot of haters in the San Francisco dining sphere. Every single time he publishes a piece that uh, bashes someone, they quickly come out of the woodwork to either dismiss him or, or criticize him in some way, shape, or form. But it's not just with his individual reviews either. It's with his top 100 list that he does every year. And through his perspective in general, there's a lot of really ambitious food coming out of San Francisco. And to think that one guy, not to mention a really old school guy, can wrap his head around everything that's been happening is a stretch at best. So I'm not totally knocking Michael Bauer, but I, I see where the criticism comes from. So there's not much more to say for me with that. I 100% respected his opinion in all of the articles that he wrote. Uh, there's no question he knows his stuff when it comes to eating out. But I definitely feel, just based on my observation of people's reactions of him over the past few months, uh, especially with me doing this show and covering a lot of his reviews, uh, he's been on his way out for a while. And I'm really excited to see who they hire on for that position and moreover, will they keep him or her anonymous to start? Will they limit it to just the newspaper? Will they pursue more online content or video content or a podcast? Will they completely scrap that top 100 list? Uh, some of the articles I was reading says he has a team of 18 people that he works with. 
So will they carry on that list? There's so many questions, but I feel like there's so many ripe opportunities in a city like San Francisco, especially right now, to take advantage of the San Francisco Chronicle brand and then do something special with it. But we will 100% see what happens, and I will keep you updated as the story progresses. Next up, and I'm surprised it hasn't already happened yet news, Phil Vitell, the critic for Chicago's Tribune, the Chicago Tribune, has been revealed. His face, his identity has been revealed. After 30 years, he's finally published a photo of his face and I honestly thought this had happened already uh, that's why I say I'm I'm surprised I didn't know that he was still anonymous but when I was at Grace we had photos of him like hung up on in the restaurant to help people remember his face so to me like he, he was already outed but when he came uh, in to eat in our opening week we had to I, I, I distinctly remember we had to pretend that we didn't know who he was because he would dine under a different name he wouldn't make a reservation under Phil Vitell obviously but just made for a hell awkward dynamic it's like that um it's like in the action movies when the spy goes behind enemy lines and like you know what both parties want out of the interaction it's just interesting so the interesting part again about this reveal is that phil wrote the piece himself about outing him it wasn't you know some blogger or it wasn't someone else at the chicago tribune phil writes the piece and himself saying quote search Search for my face online and you won't find anything useful. There still are hundreds of restaurants that have no idea what I look like. Last week, I visited a downtown hotel dining room, and the general indifference and glacial pace of the service assured me that, in this restaurant's eyes, I was just another guy off the street. Which, of course, is the goal. I want restaurants to treat me like just another guy off the street. The smart operators, the big kids, have sussed me out. Restaurants have gotten so sophisticated managing data and working social media looking up reservation names to see if they correspond to real people, for instance, that maintaining anonymity is a constant battle and my losses are mounting. There's another motivation. As journalism is becoming more of a digital enterprise than a paper and ink one, the role of video in making real connections with our readers slash viewers has expanded exponentially. It's an avenue of storytelling that I've avoided for years, and I think it's time to stop avoiding it. This is not going to change the way I go about my job. I still plan to show up unannounced using pseudonyms for making reservations and paying the bills, end quote. So as I mentioned, the big players, the ones who rely on the shining reviews from the Tribune, know well enough to do their research and to know that when they are serving the Phil Vitell or not. And I, I definitely agree with the point of that unexpected VIP service. When he was anonymous, it was this really delicate dance to make sure that this quote, quote unquote random guy had a great time. And it's Again, it goes back to that point I made earlier about the action movies where the spy goes behind enemy lines and talks to the villain about those secret plans and everyone's kind of tiptoeing around the truth uh, to the, the truth of the matter, which is actually like, hey, we know who you are. This is what I want. This is what you want. And the, the this reveal kind of makes things a, a little more transparent. So. I also read these articles in order to kind of like make sure that I give my full attention to them and then I write the script. But it's just funny the fact that I mentioned doing video in the San Francisco Chronicle story and now Phil Vitell talks about wanting to do video just makes me feel like I'm on the right track with these sorts of things. But yeah, if you don't know, now you know that's what this is what Phil Vitell looks like. All right, Ryan Sutton for Eater published his best New York City restaurants of 2018 so far. And I'm honestly not going to do a deep dive of this one because honestly, I haven't researched any of them. I've never eaten at any of them. I've only heard of a handful of the spots that he talks about. But if you're in New York City and you want to get a taste of what's hip and happening, that list is 100% live. But uh, in other Eater news that came out a couple days ago that I respect a little bit more, Bill Addison just named his 18 best new restaurants, and they are Bavel in L.A., Bywater American Bistro in New Orleans, Canard in Portland, Carnitas Lonja in Lonja in San Antonio, Cote in New York, Dialogue in L.A., Elda in Maryland. Is that Maryland? That's a good question. Frenchette in New York, Kamonegi right here in Seattle, Hi Hi in Minneapolis, Hello Sailor in Cornelius, North Carolina, Major Domo in LA, Nyum Bai in Oakland, Maidan in Washington, D.C., Suerte in Austin, Theodore Rex in Houston, True Laurel in San Francisco, and Pacific Standard Time in Chicago. Addison saying, quote, cooking is always an autobiographical act to some degree. I'd argue that now the dishes emerging from the country's most exciting professional kitchens narrate personal stories like never before. There was something, I call it an acute intentionality, that I could sense and taste in my most gripping recent meals. Chefs seem more willing to risk 
expressing their honest selves on the plate, that or they can't be bothered any longer with the limitations of public assumptions and definitions around the food that they cook. They trust that what we'll eat they trust that we'll eat what they prepare and know who they are. They take pride in where they come from and they frame fine dining. They frame dining within the context of their communities, end quote. So I really want to do a food tour of the U.S. soon. Just reading articles like this really make me want to just take three months and partner with an airline and fly around and eat and kind of get back into the swing of things. There's just so many places that I feel really out of touch with and I want to do more than just kind of live vicariously through some of these writers. And covering these stories really wants me to I've said it before and I'll, I'll, I'm going to continue to say it. I don't like talking about restaurants that I haven't experienced for myself in one way, shape, or form. Um, I'm 100% okay with sharing either the facts or other people's opinions, but I'm very hesitant to talk about places where I haven't experienced it in the way that the restaurant wants me to experience it. So that being said, this article was actually produced incredibly well. Uh, I recommend you check it out if you're into food writing in any way, shape, or form. There's a little like video boomerang to go with every single restaurant, but it's like a professional boomerang. It's like shot with a nice camera, uh, and that's no doubt to make it more entertaining to read on mobile, but like the font is nice. The blurbs are well written, so I definitely definitely recommend you checking this article out if you haven't already. Next up, there's a gentleman named Dave Perel that I follow on Twitter. He is a intellectual. He is a podcast host. He's an entrepreneur, but he just published a piece called, quote, the future of food, end quote. And it's a fascinating read for me because he's outside of the industry bubble and he's incredibly well researched. He really does his homework and he looks at things from like a marketer's perspective. And I'm going to read you a few of the bullet points that he talks about and that stood out to me from this article. Again, it's called The Future of Food. He says, quote, the carnivore diet is taking off. That's one bullet point. Another bullet point, the costs of acquiring a customer are rising. So what does that do to the industry? Quote, to succeed in the modern age, I encourage companies to develop and maintain a direct relationship with their customers. In practice, the best brands are producing original content and becoming quasi media companies, end quote. And what's great about Perel is that he offers a rebuttal to that in in his own article. Like he gives a bullet point and then he go he explores the other side. That's really why I like his reading his uh, writing a lot. He says, "quote Content isn't the only solution to a rising to rising customer acquisition costs. I wouldn't be surprised if vending machines and small computer powered retail like experiences make a comeback. You heard it here first. Consider this quote from the CEO. Uh, well, I'm not going to share that quote." Uh, He continues to highlight the small, transparent, health-conscious brands instead of the larger, one-size-fits-all packaged food companies, which is another... It's important to get out of the restaurant sphere because we're so focused in that in that realm when in reality the people that actually feed the masses are these big packaged food brands. And he uses a oat milk company called Oatly as a as a case study, and he lists like what they put about their brand on their packaging as a really interesting uh, uh, case study in this transparency, being health conscious, uh, being small, and admitting that you're small. Um, it's 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 overall it just confirms what we've known for a long time, right? Things ebb and flow. It's a really practical strategy to go where the herd is not, and in the, not in the naive sense where you're like, oh, everyone's doing tasting menus. I'm gonna serve the entire menu on one plate or serve one just big plate of food. Um, That's probably not smart unless your execution is spot on. But he mentions that like when everyone's going vegan and plant-based and raw and vegetarian, it could actually be cool to eat 100% meat in your diet. And he shows that it works. So um, another point that I think Perel does surprisingly well is when he talks about the way that the world actually is and then forms his article around that. He's not chasing trends in any sort of way. He's finding that the trends are happening, and then he's giving his own commentary on it. And he's very, very much so consumer first in that in that way, as opposed to kind of sharing his own ideals and how he thinks the world should be, because frankly, it's way easier to see, oh, people like computer-powered retail experiences. Let's do some research into that and figure out why and how I can become a part of it. And then when the time comes, like, take advantage of it as opposed to chasing the next thing or convince, worse, convincing your customers that they need what you have to offer. So if you're even remotely 
into learning about marketing or building a brand or thinking differently, I really highly recommend David Perel's content. I've personally been following for a couple months now. I really, really enjoy his stuff. His latest post on him from food was just a perfect opportunity for me to slide it into this show and share it with you podcast folks because it's actually related. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I've retweeted his stuff a couple times. So stay tuned there if you want to keep uh, following following that along. So next up, Eater's Young Guns 2018 says that there's this gentleman named Niels Brisbane. He's right here in Seattle, and he hopes to, quote unquote, change how the Pacific Northwest eats, end quote. So let's get into that. He was a sous chef at Canlis. He has a degree in biology, and he is now the culinary director of Canlis Research Kitchen at the Bread Lab in Burlington, Washington. Eater writing, quote, in his new role, Brisbane hopes to assist in building a better, more sustainable, better sourced Northwest food shed. Most agricultural areas have between three and five economically viable plants that they grow. Skagit County has 80, which is crazy. The soil is the in the top 3% in the world. The climate is phenomenal. You can't help but have things grow, and they grow really beautifully and with really high nutritional content. I'm going to help put the focus on the products that the farmers grow and the whole region and all it can produce, end quote. So I'm, of course, always fascinated with stories like this, but it's even more impactful because it's in my neck of the woods. So I sent Niels a message on Instagram. I really, really hope to interview him for the show someday soon. We will, we will see what happens with that. That was close. I almost uh, missed that story. I, uh, I, they were, at the beginning of the show, I said I was going to cover a story on French laundry plating, but because there wasn't like a direct link to it, I essentially forgot to cover it in this show. So we're going to talk about it right now, and I'm going to add it to the podcast. It's a very uh, meta uh, thing. So I tweeted out here. I'm going to put the photo up right here so you can see it. But I tweeted out, I wasn't going to say it, but I'd be lying if I didn't think it lately. And that was in response to this gentleman's tweet uh, Richie Nakano, he is at Line Cook on Twitter. He has this photo where he says, quote, is the current chef at the French Laundry a recent culinary school grad or dot, dot, dot? Well, no, no dot, dot, dots. But then he posts these two photos. And I think it's fascinating uh, the way that this is being perceived by everybody because it seems very simple. It seems very not three Michelin stars to do it, but as someone who worked there, I feel like I have such a different, a different opinion about it because I know what they're going for. They're not going for any sort of fluff. They're not going for, they're going for finesse. And there is finesse in, you know, if we'll look at a couple of these uh, photos up here, I can tell that that's like a cheese course with something in that disc that is just like, it takes an insanely long time to either prep and then glaze or like, perfect Marcona almonds, that puree probably has something really, really special about it that took a ton of time to either set as a fluid gel, and those strawberries were perfectly cut and then compressed individually uh, with a xanthan gum solution. And then even looking at this frittata, like the way that they present every single piece of mise en place, it's engineered to be like an assembly line. Like you can just plate one after the next after the next. And it's just really interesting to see someone bash it so hard. I've been noticing it definitely where I would see Michelin post a photo of a French laundry dish and I'm like, that's uh, that's a little too simple. You know, like it's, 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 it's not super minimal, but there's not a very defined modern aesthetic to it. So it's just something I wanted to talk about. It's something that I've been noticing in my own right, but because I worked there and then I left, I didn't really feel like it was in the best light for me to cover it in that way. But I mean, this guy has way more Twitter followers than I do. He's, uh, he's verified and he's talking about it in just as negative of a light. So I wanted to cover it. Do you guys have any thoughts on the French laundry plating style lately? Have you been keeping up with some of the photos and you're like, that doesn't really look that good, uh, or do you still think that there's power in simplicity? Definitely let me know down low in the comments. Back to the real show. Last up in industry style news, this is direct answer. You folks send me a direct message, and if you're willing to let me share, I love answering it here on the show to help more people that might have the same problem. So this comes from Aditya D2806. He says, hey, Justin. I got an internship at a Michelin star restaurant. After the internship, I want to work in the restaurant. What are the things I can do to get a job in the restaurant after the internship? Looking forward to hearing from you. So what I say to him, and 
I apologize because I feel like I read the question wrong that you like you haven't you got the internship, but afterwards you want to get an internship somewhere else. So this might change my answer a little bit. I said, quote, make as many connections as you can and leverage your network to make your next move and focus on learning principles instead of recipes. It doesn't change. My, 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 I guess my advice doesn't 100% change. You can't have the audacity to think that as an intern, you're going to make the biggest impact on a restaurant. Um, I certainly thought that. I thought I was going to... Uh, you know, be next in line to become a line cook at, at, at per se when I went from internship to wanting a job. And in reality, I've told this story before, I had all the connections, but when it came time from graduating school and going back to the restaurant, they were like, go get a line cook job in, in, in four months, we'll, we'll call you. Like, go get a job somewhere else and we'll call you when, when an opening becomes available. Um, having that in, as far as like putting in the, the work hours of, you know, knowing that you've met all these people and you've worked with all these people, that's going to make it so much easier to either send that text message or that email or that Instagram DM and say, hey, uh, I'm really thinking about staying on. Would you be interested in hiring me? If a position opens up, um, I'm working with a coaching client right now who is in that place where he's staging. Uh, he wants a position to open up, but he's kind of putting in that legwork of working for free, essentially, so that if and when a job opening becomes available, he's the first person that comes to mind. Um, so there is a strategy behind it, and it does work if done well. And if the t again, if the timing goes right, um, it's definitely a, a, a good way to do it. But focus on your connections and focus on making sure that you're learning you're not just good at doing the dishes that are instructed to you. You're learning about the principles and the philosophy of the restaurant because that is what's going to ultimately make it easier to get the job once you uh, once that time comes. And I really hope that answered your question. Um, so much of it is out of your hands when you're an intern because they don't have any sort of skin in the game as far as like financially because they haven't put any skin in it as far as like paying you so yes you've put a lot of legwork in and unfortunately you just kind of got to hope that the position becomes available if you don't have anything else to bring to the table um but yeah i hope that answers your question and uh yeah i'm always happy to get dms from you folks answer questions and of course as a friendly reminder if you want to go deeper talk through your ambitions progressing your career getting that raise at work or building a personal brand I do offer one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. It's usually about an hour. If it's something that you want to explore, check out justincona.com slash coaching. That does help this show, and it allows me to go way deeper than just a back-and-forth message and really help you with your specific ambitions. So for making it this far in the show, enter uh, code end of the show. That's all one word, and I like to give you folks that listen this far into the podcast a sweet, sweet discount on a coaching session as a thank you. So in our non-industry story, Zachary sent me this lecture from Virgil Abloh, who is a designer that's huge in the fashion and streetwear space. He has a brand called Off-White, if you aren't familiar. He did a talk at Harvard all about his personal philosophy and his thought process behind some of the projects that he's done, and it is fascinating. I really, really hold those Harvard lectures in high regard. I remember when Wiley Dufresne and Grant Ackett's were giving their talks at Harvard right when the modernist cuisine movement was happening. And you folks know I'm a huge fan of getting inspiration from other industries. So if you're creatively motivated and you want to check that out, it, it's a little over an hour. It's kind of long and you actually need to watch the video because he gives some visual examples to his work when he's giving certain references. But if you spread it out over like 20 minutes a, a day for like three days, you can definitely uh, breeze right through it. I have no doubt you will be inspired if you're uh, any sort of motivated within like the fashion or uh, high-end modern art kind of way. Um, but I love when you folks send me these kinds of things to check out too. So keep sending me stuff as well if you want me to either check it out and it will most likely end up on the show. So that will do it for this week's show, episode 74. As per usual, if you have stories you want covered in the next show, which will be in two weeks, shoot them to me on Twitter, hashtag the emulsion so I can find them. And let's take a quick peek at Instagram and see if there's any questions that I can answer before I cut. Thanks for listening to the emulsion podcast. I appreciate your ears more than you know. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help sponsor the show, head on over to patreon.com slash Justin Kana. Other ways you can help out right now include giving this show a review on iTunes so more people can find it. I also love seeing you folks liking and commenting on the video if you listen that way, or even just share this episode with a 
a friend. Now is normally why I would tell you that my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one, but you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to, so I'm just going to get out of the out of the way here. Excuse, excuse me. <laughs>